Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for attending this. I will, as um, Michael said, I will present um, in general the ISA Earth Observation Program that has already been presented a little bit by, by Javier, but in particular the explorer missions. Although I will also present a little bit about the Copernicus Program, which is quite interesting program as well. This is basically the three main topics that I will present: the, the general uh, program and the reason for, for this program, the Copernicus a little bit, and in detail the Earth Explorer missions. Okay, the East Earth Observation Program, it's uh, basically uh, it's, uh, it's the largest program in ESA and is uh, reflecting the, uh, is the response to the society problems regarding some key problems on the issues on the, on the scientific and social challenge for climate change and, and things like this. And also to try to to see for a special uh, space contribution for zero hunger uh, idea in the world, clean water and sanitation, uh, affordable clean energy, and sustainable cities and communities. All this is addressed by the by the uh, ESA Earth Observation Program. It is based mainly in inspiration for for ideas and needs from from the, from the society, as I said before, but it's also is uh, the Earth Observation Program is also is uh, boost European technology and the innovative industry and jobs growing, and it's also a general responsibility of ESA to to work with with the, with the society. The overall budget for the uh, that uh, as it was approved for the next two years in the latest um, um, meeting in Seville, Space 19. The meeting was to 2,500 millions, and it's um, around 600 people around Europe, and in the five different sites in in Europe, uh, as already mentioned by Javier, as in Italy, as in Holland, Ixat in UK, uh, headquarters in France, ISOC in Germany, and also ISAC in Spain. And inside the this uh, Earth Observation Program, we have three main. Um, Two programs, which are the Meteorological Program, the Copernicus, and the Science, which are the what is called the Earth Explorers missions. This is the overall budget approved. Uh, is approved by, uh, in the last Council meeting in in December last year, and as you can see, the around 25% of the budget is for the Earth observation. is the largest budget for for ESA. All start um, in the 90s, in the early 90s, uh, with the first uh, satellites launched by ESA, dedicated to Earth observation. Uh, there were uh, ERS-1 that was launched in 1991 and finished in year 2000. Followed by the ERS-2, there was a sort of twin satellite with uh, ERS-1, and this was launched in 95 and finished in 2011. And then the largest uh, Earth observation satellite launched by by ESA at uh, that time, and still is, is the largest satellite, was MVSAT, that was launched in 2002 and finished uh, suddenly to an anomaly on board in 2012. These three missions were the, the 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 main pillars for the for the start of the Earth observation uh, program in ESA. Although at that time was still not called, uh, there was no uh, such uh, Earth observation program. But these two, these three missions generate in total around two uh, petabytes of, of data and store two decades of uh, stored data. Of course, the data preservation for these three missions has been key in order to to compare this data with the new satellites that we ESA is currently launching. Uh, this is the the whole Earth observation program. As you may see, it is uh, divided in three. Main uh, uh, topics of subprograms. One is the the science Earth Explorer. This is starting in year. The, the first mission was Goche. We'll talk later. Then the smalls, and then the, the new missions missions that will come in the next few years. Also the Copernicus, which is the largest uh, Earth observation program on Earth, and then the meteorological um, um, uh, projects uh, that uh, are shared between ESA and UMETSAT. In total, we are currently having 15 Earth observation satellites in operation, um, 40 under development, and 30 more under preparation. These uh, three uh, sub programs, uh, in the case of Earth Explorers, is defined by by science partners uh, in uh, through uh, some through open calls that ESA made. 
And in the case of uh, Copernicus, is a uh, share between the UMETSAT, which is the, the agency dedicated to the meteorological predictions in Europe, and the European Union, which is uh, it's from is providing the, the, the aims and the objectives for the for the uh, for the missions. In the case of Copernicus, uh, ESA is taking care of the space component, basically developing the satellites, uh, performing the launch when, when, when required, and also the service components, which is mainly provided by UMETSAT or some other companies, all, all, everything uh, managed by, by the European Union. The fleet of satellites uh, for the Copernicus mission, uh, it uh, was the first one, it's called Sentinel missions. The first mission was Sentinel-1, A and B, and then followed by Sentinel-2, A, 3A, and we'll see now all these all these missions. What important thing for this program, this Copernicus program, is the fact that all the data is free, and is free and, and easy data uh, for, for, for accessing uh, for everywhere in, everybody in the world without any problem. These are the first bunch of satellites already uh, in orbit, Sentinel-1 A and B. C and D will plan, is currently under development. Sentinel-1 is dedicated to weather and night day applications uh, using interferometry and what is called a SARA, synthetic aperture radar. Sentinel-2 is a multispectral image uh, uh, mission, which also uh, contains uh, two satellites, A and B, which are in the same orbit, but uh, separated by uh, 180 degrees. And Sentinel-3, it's uh, also we have A and B missions, uh, satellites, and dedicated to general land and sea surveillance, and are dedicated to vegetation, land, sea, superficial temperatures, altimetry, and so on. Sentinel-4 is basically, uh, um, it's not a satellite itself, it's a, a set of instruments that will be on board of uh, future meteorological satellites called Metrosat third generation. And they and are dedicated to uh, ultraviolet, uh, near-infrared uh, spectrometer. And uh, then Sentinel-5, which is, um, contains only one satellite already launched, which is called Sentinel-5 precursor 5P, and it is dedicated to the uh, atmosphere composition, contamination, pollution, and so on. Sentinel-6, which will be launched in no less than one month now, on the 10th of November, by um, from the United States, although it's a European mission, and will be dedicated to the sea level and wind speed and waves. Hey, uh, hey. This is the overall program. As you may see, we have um, these are the, the launch dates, and then every every Sentinel is followed by a, a second generation that will uh, launch in around uh, 2021, 2022, in such a way that we'll have always continuity for the program, the same for the Sentinel 2, 3, and so on. And now new missions will come in, and I will explain later. But the important thing of the Sentinel and Copernicus program is an operational program then, uh, ESA is always uh, trying to get data all the time, and we need uh, satellites uh, for, for many, many years. And the solution is to have a long continuity for a program. Regarding the, the data volume and users, uh, um, we have uh, more than 320 registered users using daily data from uh, Copernicus. We have uh, six operational services dedicated to land, data, atmosphere, ocean, climate, uh, disaster and security. And around 250 terabytes of uh, data is distributed per day. And as I said before, with a full and um, free open data policy. Now European Union ESA is preparing the, the next generation of, of satellites. Uh, just to highlight the importance of the, of the, of the economical benefits for the, for the global geospatial program, some estimations made in the year 2015 says that uh, uh, the invest money of, uh, of 27 billion uh, US dollars is converted into uh, 72 in the uh, year 20, and basically for European um, Persons or people, uh, one euro, one euro spent on Copernicus reverting to ten euros on in, in companies and economical growth, which is really important. Then, basically, the money invested in the Copernicus program uh, gives a lot of profit and in new uh, ideas, 
products and companies that uh, all around Europe. This graphic shows the, um, the data uh, archive evolution, taking into account the Sentinel missions, the, the Earth Explorers, and the, the previous heritage missions, uh, as I mentioned before, ERS-1, ERS-2, and MBSAT. As you may see, the amount of data is, is growing exponentially, and it's, it's a real challenge to maintain this data and to distribute in a safe manner and in a quick manner. This is also a very important problem. For the new Copernicus missions, uh, European Union has already approved the next generation of uh, uh, satellites that will fly. They will not call any more uh, sentinels. They have more dedicated to uh, topics. We had the first mission that already approved is the CO2M, which identify sources of greenhouse gases. Then the next mission already approved is Crystal, which is dedicated to the polar ice and snow uh, topography. And we'll investigate the effects of the climate change in the, in the polar ice. The uh, another mission is still an, under development, but it will be launched in around seven years or so, is the SIMER, which is a passive microwave emitter that will, will be used to, to, um, to get data about the surface temperature of the sea and the ice concentration. The second, the, the fourth one is the LST land surface temperature emission, which uh, will be dedicated to uh, agriculture and water productivity. SHIME, which is the, an spectral image mission that will be used to, to extract data for the food security, soil, minerals, and biodiversity. And the ROS L, which is a L band SAR mission that will be dedicated for the vegetation and ground motion moisture. All these missions will be launch in the next 10 years and will provide continuity to the to the uh, to the program to the Copernicus program just to show some uh, inf inf um, that information of the products of the sentinel one mission for instance now you will see a video showing the the, the radiometer, uh, inf the scattermeter information got by Sentinel-1 uh, before and after uh, of earthquake that happened in California on the 24th of August 2014. This was, I will just, sorry, I will stop the video a little bit because it goes too fast. But this information is basically the, this data provides the displacement of the, of the, of the ground before and after the, the, the earthquake in in California, and this was seen by by Sentinel One data. Uh, then the, the next part of the video is just uh, a, a Peterman glacier in Greenland that saw uh, interferometer images, uh, so in the displacement of the of the of the glacier. This particular part of the video is the um, uh, displacement of the. I'm uh, sorry, uh, back. This shows a displacement of the of the uh, Larsen ice shelf in located in Antarctica, as was seen in July 2017. More data about the um, uh, Sentinel-1. This is provided by both satellites, Sentinel-1 uh, A and B, and this shows the uh, ground deformation of, uh, after um, an earthquake, also in Italy, in the Castelluccio area where we could see the displacement of around 70 centimeters detected by, by, the, by the satellite, which is quite amazing. And this was done also with data quite before and after the, the earthquake. More data on the, on the Sentinel-1A. This is a, a big incident that happened in Colombia in the, called the mall side in Mocoa which shows the, the, the displacement of, of the land after, uh, after this motor slide in this area. And this was triggered by heavy rain. And again, the, the Sentinel-1 satellite uh, provide this information after the, the catastrophe, and where it's clearly possible to see the, the displacement of, of the land uh, after the, the big event. Here, where, what I'm showing is uh, some rather images from Sentinel-1 as well, that uh, what is uh, the displacement of the, of the also a glacier in, in Norway, 
where you is possible to see the front end glacier moving uh, more than 300 meters per year. More data in this case, this is Sentinel 3A, and this uh, shows the, the radiation emitted by, by the Earth, which uh, reveals how the temperature of the, of the Earth changes between July and November, in this case, year 2016. You can see how it evolves uh, the temperature of the, of the whole Earth. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the, the satellites provide a global view, which is much better to have different sensors around the world. And in, in this way, the, the satellites uh, show us uh, the whole Earth in one shot. To see more uh, examples of uh, uh, data from the Sentinel satellites, this is uh, an example of uh, data provided by Sentinel-3A. And this provides the chlorophyll uh, changes in vegetation uh, during the um, between April and May, and in this case was year 2017. And it's possible to see how, especially during the change in the spring, in the North Hemisphere, you can see the, the change in the chlorophylla. This is again data provided by Sentinel-3A. This is a video that showed the satellite uh, Sentinel-5P, which uh, was launched in uh, October 2017. And it is used to watch atmospheric composition and contamination. And it provides uh, data for uh, with uh, maps, provide maps, generate maps for different uh, um, components of the atmosphere, like in nitrogen and, and so on. You will see now some some images of the of the different components for formaldehyde, methane, and so on. It was interesting during the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis, the Sentinel-5P shows an interesting data uh, uh, contrasting the, the difference in air pollution in Europe before and after the COVID-19 and was quite uh, astonish. Now, leaving the, the uh, Copernicus program, I will now jump to the Earth Explorers mission, which is the main topic of, the, of, of the, my talk today. The Earth Exploration missions are basically research Earth exploration missions, are not, let's say, as such uh, operational missions, which uh, normally the operational missions, uh, as Copernicus, always bring standard instruments. In the case of Earth Exploration missions, is uh, basically uh, try to investigate new ways to um, to get data from the Earth with new instruments. And in that way, we, this is why we call science um, exploration science missions because these are, are new uh, and, and new complete uh, new complete missions that try to to get uh, this new data from from ground from the earth. These kind of missions are always um, uh, uh, open calls for NISA, and you know, all the scientists in Europe try to put this their proposals, and these proposals are then analyzed by the uh, committee, which is called the Advisory Committee for Earth Observation. And then, then ev in every call, several uh, candidates are uh, pre-selected, and then after two years of um, on, of uh, studies, of dedicated studies, only one mission is, is um, approved, which is at the end the mission that will be uh, developed and launched uh, in, the, in the future. So far, uh, we uh, we have uh, uh, five missions flying uh, uh, for the Earth Explorers. We have Gotse, which is was launched was the first uh, uh, Earth Explorer mission was launched in 2009 and finished in 2013. SMOS, which was launched in 2009 and is currently operating and is operating for NISAC and uh, here and in also by Kenes is a shared mission. Cryosat that was launched in 2010, Schwarm that was launched in 13, and Ailus that was launched was the latest one launched in 2018. We already have some future missions that we will uh, explain later that are already in the queue and are under development like Earth Curve, Biomass, and, and so on. It's what the important thing for this mission is, is always create science and innovation. We also have a, a huge community of scientists around Europe and the world 
using the data. Uh, today we have around more than 4,700 users. And it's also providing a lot of uh, benefits and, and publications so far around 300 per, per year. This mission is this somehow are quite risk missions because are new, are completely new. We need always to to create uh, uh, new instruments from scratch, and they are really, really uh, at the top of the, of the technology. Then some, uh, there, there is a big risk, of course, on that. But uh, at the end, the, the rewards are very, very interesting. This is uh, a different view for the, all the different uh, exploratory missions, as before. Roche was the first one, then SMOS, then Cryosat, SWARM, which is uh, dedicated to the magnetic field mission. I lose for the win, and now from this point we start with the new ones that are currently under development, and will be launched in the, in the near future, 2022, 2024, and so on. Starting for the first uh, mission, Goche. Goche is a gravity field and steady state ocean circulation explorer. As I said before, well, the first uh, explorer mission was launched in, in March 2009. And the main objectives of the mission were um, get data about the ocean circulation, uh, the, phys the physics of the Earth uh, interior, uh, geodesy, and, and sea level changes. Was launched in, in, in 2009, and the mission ends 2013 uh, because the orbit, because the data that uh, is required was required for Gotche, uh, requires to have the, the satellite in a very low orbit. Uh, um, around 200 kilometers. And in this orbit, um, the, um, the friction with the Earth atmosphere is, is too high, and then the orbit decay and decay and then uh, finish. That's the reason because the, the spacecraft has this very particular uh, uh, shape, which is very aerodynamics, because it was flying at the very high level of the atmosphere. And, and it was this very nice. Um, uh, shape for the for the satellite. Just for some data for for Gotche, Gotche was able to produce uh, the, the, the 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 most accurate uh, geodetic shape of the Earth. Uh, this seen in this picture, of course, is exaggerated, but uh, Gotche was able to produce the the, the highest uh, accuracy uh, model of the of the geodetic of, of the Earth. Then for some of the information of uh, SMOS that was able to provide during the, the operational life, was able to, to generate uh, um, uh, um, models, uh, very good models and data for the for the for the um, information of the of the ground of the Earth, uh, surface density and the structure of the thermal state and sedimentary rocks. All this was done just by checking the, the different gradients of the of the gravity measured by the satellite. And you can see that it was able to, to see much more detail and to get uh, the, the information underneath of the Earth with very high precision and even to to uh, to get information about the where the location of the gas windows, uh, oil and so on. Also, combining the Gotche joint information plus altimetry data provided by the by the satellite, uh, Gotche was able to produce a, a good model of the of the ocean surface uh, currents, uh, and as you can see in, in this map. And this data was also uh, contrast very well with uh, all the voids that were floating in the ocean, and you can see the the, the main. Uh, currents uh, derived from, from, from Gotch. Also, Gotch was able to, to get uh, much more uh, information on the on the Morovic discontinuity called MOHO. And this, uh, you know, this uh, Morovic discontinuity is uh, the boundary between the crust and the mantle in, on the Earth. And this is a map created by, by Gotch at that time it was flying. And you see all the all the big difference on the Morovic discontinuity. 
now going through the second uh, Earth uh, Explorer mission, uh, SMOS, which stands for Soil Emotion and Ocean Salinity, was launched in 2009 and it's still flying and in good shape. And as I said before, uh, the, the mission is controlled uh, from Kenes, from the French uh, Space Agency in Toulouse, and here at ISAC, where we have the control of the payload and the data, data processing and distribution at ISAC. The main uh, aim of uh, SMOS is uh, to get uh, information about these two key variables for the for the um, water cycle, what are called soil moisture and on and salinity. As an example of the It's about 30 kilometers, but with the new techniques, now even the scientists have been able to to get maps of the salinity in, in areas, in the smaller areas. This, this is, for instance, the Alboran Sea between the Morocco and Spain, and you can see now that the scientists have been able to 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 get a more data analysis tools and to, to provide these maps into areas which are much smaller. More in a small, this is a map of the Great on the Netherlands. In this case, in June uh, 2017, there was a very warm and dry spring on, on, that, uh, on that year. And this uh, map shows the, um, the, the, the soil moisture in, in, in the parts of uh, of, of uh, Holland. Uh, it's important to, to say also that uh, initially SMOS was only used for, for this soil emotion and salinity, but with uh, new techniques and so on as before, this soil emotion is, uh, is used for the weather prediction and also to, to warm about uh, possible droughts or water stress and also to improve crop yield in predictions. It's very widely used. Is most data. Cryosat was the third Earth Explorer mission, uh, and in fact, this should be called Cryosat 2 because Cryosat 1 was launched uh, two years before, I think, but uh, the launch failed, and basically the satellite uh, impact on the on the real aim of the of the satellite was the, the polar caps. The, the rocket failed, and the satellite fall in in the in, in the uh, Arctic regions. But then a new satellite was built few, two years later and then was finally launched, Kairosat 2, in, in April 2010. The mission is dedicated uh, for the ice thickness and is the fourth explorer mission and is um, monitoring uh, the land ice floating in the oceans and also the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica areas. This is just a video showing the the melting of the of the of the uh, of the ice uh, shield in in the antarctica this data is uh, showing this graph combines data from ERS and embisat and cryosat and as you see the, um, the decreasing trend is quite dramatic in all areas of the um, of the antarctica and is growing and growing in, with the years in total, if we compare the data from the ERS-1, ERS-2, MBSAT with uh, data from Cryosat, in the 90s, we have a decreasing of uh, around 53 billion tons per year. And now we have around 159 in the West Antarctic and in the Antarctic Peninsula is from 7 to 33, which is quite, quite a ton -ish. This data, uh, this graphic shows how the, the ground lines, the, uh, between the, the ice 
uh, between the, the sea and, and the ice and the glaciers are, are uh, getting back. Um, uh, and this uh, data has been um, very well seen by, by Cryosat and has seen that over the last seven years, Antarctica has lost uh, underwater ice, ice similar to the greater than London area, which is also really worrying. And this is ready with, with the glaciers that are going back. Also data from the, um, from the cryosat has been seen on the, some uh, areas of uh, Patagonia and uh, Chile. And that shows how the, the glaciers in this area of the world has also decreasing. In, in most of the glaciers, there are some uh, few exceptions like uh, we'll see now in the uh, glacier called Pio 11, which has, uh, has a little bit increased, but all the rest of the glaciers in this area of Patagonia have also decreased dramatically. So in the, the general trend of the climate change in the world, you see this is a different decreasing trend in, in, the, in, the, in the glaciers in all this area of the world, in Patagonia, and the exception of this one that was increased a little bit, all the rest are clearly decreasing. And as you can imagine, the Cariosat is a very key element to, to monitor this um, global change in the world, these areas in the Antarctica, Arctic regions, and areas where the, the ice is very clear, it's very clearly seen from, from the space. Also showing data, uh, the changes of the ice volume seen by, by, the, by the Cryosat. You see that uh, this is the increase per year for each of the month. And each year, the number of uh, cubic kilometers uh, in, of ice is decreasing, which is also quite worrying. This is the, the ice elevation changes seen by, by ERS and Envisat with less resolution in the from 90s, uh, beginning of uh, 2000. And now with, with the latest years, and uh, you can also see that uh, the, this elevation has, is changing. Uh, Cryosat also made a very good model, 3D elevation model of uh, with 99% coverage of the of the of the continent. Uh, we and has been validated with a precision of 25 uh, meters. You see this hole here in the picture is because this area is not seen by the by the Cryosat, because the the satellite is almost in a polar orbit, but the, the, it's no flying over the, exactly over the pole and that's the reason for this small hole but all the rest of the, of the Antarctic can, can be seen clearly from the space. Also Cryosat has relayed uh, the mineral water from lakes beneath uh, some uh, glacier areas in these particular cases in the uh, lake called Twaits uh, it is located in the moon sea and this this big hole is how the, the the ice is melting into water and falls into the into the sea. And this is also is being monitoring by, by, by Cryosat daily. And this shows the elevation changes. This is also how the Cryosat is monitoring the, the changes on the ice shelf and how this is moving uh, around the year. And from the year 2011 to the year 2018, you can see how these, uh, these, these things are moving. Uh, seen by by cryosat. Now jumping to the to the um, following um, Earth Explorer mission is Swarm. Swarm is is dedicated to the magnetic field mission and is composed by three different uh, satellites, which are these ones in the in the slide. And it was launched in two thousand. They, they were launched on the same rocket on two thousand thirteen. And the, uh, the mission is dedicated to, to measure the Earth core, mantle, and crust, uh, geomagnetic, and also the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. It's a very interesting mission, uh, also complementary of the mission flying for many years ago called Cluster. This, uh, this first slide for uh, uh, Schwarm uh, uh, display what is called a single event uh, electron upsets. Uh, when the, the, the constellation satellites are flying over the South Atlantic anomaly. The South Atlantic anomaly 
uh, is probably, you know, it's an uh, area of the Earth where the magnetic field is this, this, this different colors in the map. So the intensity of the magnetic field and the blue ones uh, shows the, the, the area of the world called the South Atlantic Anomaly, which is an area of the world where, where the magnetic field is really weak. And when the spacecraft are flying over this uh, really weak area, um, the, the high energy particles coming from mainly from the sun, but also from other stars or whatever place in the, in the universe, in the universe flow very freely in, in this area and impact the electronics. Then every time that one of these particles come to the, into this area and, and impact on the electronics on the satellites produce what is called single event upset. We also see many of these events in, in SMOS and then basically when a high particle, uh, high energy particle like proton or electron hints into the electronics, some of these memories get um, weird and, and then we can even get data. Then what um, this map shows uh, and the evolution is how all these three spacecraft, these three swarm uh, uh, satellites are uh, recording these events. As you may see, the, the, the highest probability for these events always happen in the South Atlantic anomaly and also in the poles where we have the com uh, converging of the, of the magnetic uh, lines on, on the Earth. And this, this data, as I said before, has been also course correlated with other missions, uh, many other missions that have single event upset. For instance, as a matter of curiosity, Normally, when when uh, satellite operations has to be performed for for low orbits for low uh, satellite orbits, uh, and we need to make some operations, we always try to avoid to make operations close to the South Atlantic anomaly to avoid these kind of problems on the on the memories and the electronics. Also, a new discovery by by Swarm was the what is called the local uh, liquid iron jet stream, that is. Uh, uh, it's a thousand kilometers beneath the surface, and it's a boundary region that uh, where the magnetic field floats in a, in, a, in a sort of liquid. And this has been discovered by by swarm satellites, and it, this uh, this uh, jet stream moves uh, around forty kilometers a year. Also, one interesting uh, issue with the that uh, has discovery um, um, swarm is the the blackout of the of the um, GPS satellites. It's, it's a known issue that uh, for all the all the Earth orbit satellites, we always have a GPS receiver on board that is used to uh, to compute the spacecraft position and and, and time. And in few occasions, uh, sometimes happen that. Uh, the, the signal for the GPS satellites uh, get lost from these uh, other satellites, like for instance, SWARM or, or SMOS. And when this happens, basically you don't get information about the, the GPS and you don't get uh, information about your position and velocity. And this has been seen that uh, normally happen um, over the equator between Africa and South America. And uh, is normally the reason for this is a sort of a thunderstorm for, of electrons that happened in that part of the of the world, especially at uh, uh, midnight, and this has been discovered by Bashwarm. Basically, when this one of these outage of a GPS signals happen for these satellites, uh, Swarm has been checked uh, have, or has been seen that the there is a big thunderstorm of um, electrons in the magnetosphere, and this uh, performs a blackout of the signal from the GPS. Another phenomenon that has been seen uh, has been not completely analyzed, but at least understood a little bit is what is called a stiff. A stiff is a purple streak of light in the polar uh, night skies that happen during the auroras phenomenon sometimes. And originally it was thought to be a proton arc, but um, Swarm has measured this uh, stiff phenomenon and has detected uh, increase of temperature of around um, um, 300, uh, uh, 3,000 uh, 3, degrees and an altitude of 300 kilometers. The phenomenon has st still not very well understood, but at least uh, Swarm is, has been able to, to get data for these temperature changes for around this uh, phenomenon. 
also this uh, inform this um, um, video now is uh, data collected by by two satellite two collection of satellites champ which is a german uh, constellation as well and uh, and swarm uh, and and this shows the uh, the the changes of the uh, magnetic field in the lithosphere of the earth where blue shows area we uh, blue is negative um, uh, a negative uh, magnetic field and red is uh, positive and this data has been done by by uh, both uh, missions champ and swarm combining data from both which is also very typical uh, synergy that uh, we always use in earth observation satellites where you get data from different uh, missions in order to come to get uh, models from from the earth and this case is a man um, a model of the lithospheric magnetic field as already mentioned, you see the difference of the magnetic field in the different areas of the world. More in the swarm, um, swarm has been able to uh, uh, monitor the impact of the of the uh, uh, charged particles in the in the salty ocean, and this signal is really really weak. But uh, this has been able uh, swarm is able to detect the signal. And this video here shows the impact of the of this particular into the into the salty ocean, and the magnetic field generated, which is quite amazing. You see, this is also uh, all the dif all the difference that you also see as due to the moon and, and the tilt of the moon, and the change of the shape is uh, due to the this tilt tidal signal, also by 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 swarm. Now going through the next uh, um, Earth Explorer mission was uh, ILUS was launched in uh, 22nd of August 2018, and it was a mission, a very complicated mission that uh, has only one instrument on board, called Aladdin, and uh, it was the first ultraviolet leader in space, and it was a mission was delayed for many years because of the complexity of, of the instrument because. Uh, has a, an onboard uh, ultraviolet um, uh, laser that impacts the, the the Earth, and then the reflection is analyzed by a telescope that is in, on the satellite. And the, the problem the, that uh, the, the the people have to do during the development was to to get a stabilization on the on this laser was really, really complicated, and then this was the reason for the delay. Then finally, the satellite was launched and has a, a orbit, uh, circular orbit with an altitude of 320 kilometers, which is quite a low orbit, and a lifetime of three years. The main objective of the ILUS is to measure the the, the, the speed, uh, the velocity, the speed, the speed of, of, the, of the winds on the Earth, and this is an animation of how this is this is uh, done. This is basically this this uh, the instrument is sending some ultraviolet pulse to the to the Earth, and this the the, the signal the reflecting signal is analyzed by the telescope, and this data is processing, and um, is used to to derive the the speed of the, of the winds. Uh, it's important to say that it was a complete novel mission in the sense that. Uh, was the first mission to detect the, the velocity of the winds with such a, a precision, and the scientists were really, really at, uh, amazed by 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 the result of the mission. See now, this this are an example of the results of the of the of the of, of Phylus, um, and this is the, the speed of the winds and the different regions of the of the Earth as the, the spacecraft is flying. Uh, and as I said before, the, the, the results were so amazing that the scientists, uh, since I said before, uh, Earth explorers are one-shot mission normally, they, they launch the mission, and unless the, the scientists are extremely happy, they require uh, to have another one. And this was the case for ILUS. ILUS, um, the results were so incredible, and in fact, all... Uh, some uh, some organizations like ACUWMF in London, they were so happy that they, with the data of prior bylaws that the, the weather predictions improve a lot due to this this uh, satellite. That now uh, the scientists have signed um, a letter to the European Union and, and also ESA to develop a new one in the next few years. And now let's say ILUS will fly 
in the next future in a sort of Copernicus mission because it has been proved to be a real, real good mission. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, then, sorry. Now, just talking about the, the future Earth Explorers mission. The, um, uh, these are the, the, the first one will be the Earth Explorer number six, which is, uh, we'll call Earth Curve. And um, Earth Curve will be uh, dedicated to uh, uh, the investigation for clouds, aerosols, and radiation. And it's uh, a partnership with, with, with JAXA, which is a Japanese uh, uh, space agency, and, and both ESA and JAXA will collaborate for the development of this mission. This mission will employ a high performance uh, radar uh, and with a technology that has never been used before, and the launch is uh, planned to be in 2022. Uh, there were uh, se several uh, in instruments on board. And then a consortium of uh, several uh, countries, uh, Germany, France, uh, Japan, uh, UK. The spacecraft will fly in an orbit of 393 kilometers and uh, the weight of the satellite is uh, almost 2000 kilos. This was the Earth Explorer number six. Number seven will is called biomass and will provide uh, estimates of, uh, uh, of the biomass on, on ground and will use uh, radar uh, technologies and will be the first P-band SAR in space. The launch is planned so far in 2022. This was the air, uh, mission Earth Explorer number seven. The number eight is FLEX, it's called FLEX and will be dedicated to provide uh, global maps of uh, vegetation fluorescences, uh, photosynthetic activity. And we also carry a novel uh, sensor called iPlan uh, that we we'll use to, to receive this kind of information. As I said before, all these missions will always have uh, new instruments to, to be developed in a very uh, challenged way. More details about the biomass, the future biomass, uh, will will be uh, what is called a P-band radar, which will be a huge antenna. This antenna, of course, will be fold in, in the rocket, and then when the satellite is launched, will be deployed. And um, this will be a really, really challenging uh, uh, mission. The lifetime is 5.5 years. Flex, as I said before, is uh, will monitor the, the fluorescence uh, signal uh, to to vegetation, and uh, will have a swap of 150 kilometers. The swap is the, the area covered by the by the instruments, and the satellite will have a will be small somehow will be a weight of 470 kilos, and the launch day currently is 2024 with a foreseen mission duration of 3.5 years. Now for the future missions, uh, for uh, the Explorer 9, it was approved, I think it was this year. There were two candidates, as I said before, the, the whole process for the Earth Explorer missions uh, is an open call that ESA made. And then several candidates were received. Then after uh, the first um, cut, only two missions were uh, semi-approved or for um, um, a scheme. These two missions for a scheme were um, analyzed and were developing what is called a phase A. And then finally, ESA only um, uh, decided to take a mission forum. The other mission that was uh, finally uh, canceled or no, not taken into account was this scheme that was used. Uh, the idea was to uh, see surface cinematics monitoring and forum that uh, has been Sorry, so a proof. It will be a far infrared uh, radiation um, uh, mission that will measure the greenhouse effect in the future. The launch is foreseen in 2007, uh, 27 or 28, still some time for the launch. Now, currently, ESA is in the um, um, uh, pre approval of the what, what is called the Earth Explorer mission number 10. Now we there are three candidates 
uh, at this point in time, which are um, the Harmony, Daedalus, and Hydroterra, and the launch is foreseen in 2031 or 32. Um, the forum, uh, as before, was uh, selected as Explorer number nine, and will be used to to um, to to, to, uh, to the atmosphere uh, emission spectrum from this range. For the Earth Explorer ten, that uh, the final candidate, as far as I know, will be decided at the end of this year. There are three candidates at this point in time. One is the Daedalus mission that is uh, will be used as a sort of a magnetic mission as well, similar to to SWAM. Um, will be used to 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 see the, the energy deposition of the uh, on the on the on the magnetosphere. The second uh, candidate is called Harmony mission, which is uh, will be used to measure uh, the surface deformation. And the third one is the Hydroterra, which will be used to monitor the diurnal water cycle. It's a sort of similar to a small somehow, and also to contribute to the water cycle. As I said before, these three missions, uh, now only one will be decided, and will be probably, most probably at the end of this year, the one that will be selected. Then um, for the next, uh, I don't know why it's not moving. Okay, now it's moving. The next uh, call for ideas was made in for a, an Earth next Earth Explorer uh, number eleventh was made in May two thousand twenty this year, and now he says currently in the process to receive all the all the calls for these new ideas for this new Earth Explorer number eleven. And then, as similar to the previous process, uh, one ESA received all the all the uh, all these ideas. Will uh, two missions or three missions will be pre-selected, and then another one will be finally selected with a launch probably in 2035 or between 35 and 40. Not long time ago from now. Now, just as a final, in case you want to see some more information about the Earth observation uh, missions in ESA. I have put uh, once you get the distribution for the for this presentation some links for the Earth Observation Program. One, what is the called the Living Planet Program, which is uh, the, the, the source information for the Earth observation, also for the Copernicus and also for the Earth Explorers missions. And that was all from my side. 